God bless. Thank you for letting me be up here, Dad, to share a little bit. I'm going to jump right into it. In Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Considering the day and time we're living in, and the wonderful, most amazingly awesome leadership some of us have had the privilege to be led by and go along with, I have consequently been thinking about lawbreakers. More specifically, lawbreakers in the Bible. And what? There's lawbreakers in the Bible? Um, this morning, I want to look at a few records of men and women of God in the Bible that decided to go against the law of the land. They knew what the law was and willfully chose to not abide by it. The first record I'd like to look at is, are three outlaws, three familiar outlaws, and we can find their record in Daniel chapter 3, if you want to turn there. Daniel chapter 3, this is my oldest son's favorite record, and we're going to start in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that he had set up. Verse 4, Then an herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So this is the new law of the land. Verse 7, Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of all those musical instruments, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that hears that music needs to bow down to that golden image which you had set up. Verse 11, And whoso followed not down, and worship that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace there are certain jews whom you hath set over the affairs of the province of babylon shadrach meshach and abednego the outlaws these men o king have not regarded thee they serve not thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up then nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring shadrach meshach and abednego then they brought these men before the king Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at the time ye hear the sound of the music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, be it, be, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The law was clear, and it was repeated multiple times and announced over the radio and the local news channels. This was not like our day and time when you drive to work and wonder how many laws you might be breaking on your way there. Uh, this was an overly obvious law, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego willfully, and if you look at it, quite respectfully decided to break. Who were these men? Were they habitual lawbreakers? Quite the opposite. 
they were in the Oval Office amongst the lawmakers. It says in Daniel 1.17 that God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. Also, the president, the king, found them ten times smarter and more helpful than any other of the joint chiefs of staff or the council there. Who gave them their knowledge? God. Who was working in them when they decided to break the law? God. Obviously God, because usually the law of fire states that when you jump into a big one, you're going to die. And we know what happened to those guys. They didn't die. Let's look at another one. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 6. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Does that make sense? He's going to put them under their thumb, so the chance that they may rise against Egypt. So he was afraid of them. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built the Pharaoh treasures treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. It was hard. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Sapphira, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, I had a bad joke I was going to say there, but I'm not going to say it. Anymore. And he said, when you do the offense of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see upon the stools, if it be a son, then you should kill him. If it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, respected God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the men children alive. They broke the law. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and are delivered ere the midwives come unto them. So they delivered before they got there. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. There's another rule from the governor. A little different time than our current time, I do agree. But it was the law of the land at that time. The governor of Egypt clearly stated the new law. Save the girls, kill the boys. Chapter 2, verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, to, that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. That in itself is a miracle. And when she could not longer hide him, she took him for an ark of bur bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put them and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. We in our family watch this movie, The Prince of Egypt. It's an old cartoon. And in their depiction, it's puts it in this basket, and then it goes down this big river, and the alligator just misses it, and the fish tries to get it, and the eagle tries to eat it, and it's all this thing. But as it's written, it's purposely put it next to some flags so that somebody would see it. So, you know, Hollywood, I guess. Um, all right, 
end of verse 3, verse 4. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. She was saying, what's going to happen? And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give you money. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. So, what was the law? hide your boy for three months, then put him in a buoyant waterproof crib near some flags where the, the daughter of Pharaoh could see him and adopt him, and then hire his own mother and to nurse him? Was that the law? No, that was not the law. Why do you think she chose not to obey the law? Hebrews 11.23, you don't have to turn there. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because he they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. That's why. How do you know when God is working in you or in another person? My dad always taught me this. How do you know a prophet is a prophet? When it comes to Christ. Yeah, the fruit. You see the fruit of it. That's how you know. And I think it's fair to say God was working in that mother and father to do the will, to do his will, because that boy Moses is a fairly popular person in the place. <laughs> Consider Daniel in the lion's den. What was the law then? You know? Consider Mary and Joseph when Jesus was born. There was another law that went out that all the boys had to die. The same reason these guys were breaking the rules. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Oh, that's what I meant. They broke the rules the same way these guys were going to look at the reason why they broke the rules. That makes more sense. Okay, Acts chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and they, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. They were mad. And laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple of the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with them, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to, to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened it, we found no man within. 24. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. They are breaking the rules. Then when the captain with the officers and then went the captain and the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly look you right in the eyes and command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, and this is the same reason why 
Everybody else we looked at broke the rules. We ought to obey God rather than men. In all the records we looked at and referenced, the bottom line was that those individuals decided believing God and his rules were more important than man's rules. And how did they know? How did they know which laws to follow and which ones to break? The same way we, as Christ-in's sons and daughters, do today. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Philippians 2, verse 1. Let me flip there. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings or disputings that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you will shine as lights in the world. Have no doubt that God is working within you. I guess lately I've been more encouraged than normal to give the one finger salute to some of the rules and laws of our current time. Hence the lawbreakers we briefly looked at in the Bible. But I was reminded that that is probably not how God is going to work within me. As children of God in our day and time, we are to put on the mind of Christ. Think like he did. Serve like he did. And how did he do it? Talk about a rule follower <laughs> and a law follower. He encouraged his disciples not only to do the law, but go above and beyond at times. Remember the armor? Carry it two miles, the law was one. If some dumb man law gets in the way of God's people or his plan, you'll know what to do. God will work within you as he always does. And I think that's, yeah, that's my last page. That's what I wanted to share. This morning. Thank you, Bill. And guess where I was going to end up this morning in my teaching? The Philippians. Right there. But God bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll go to the Old Testament. Jeremiah. Chapter 1. Just a couple of things that I found to be interesting this week. In the Walking in God's Power Advanced class, we've been in Jeremiah a lot. And mostly that, what we've been doing there is getting our butts kicked. <laughs> There's a lot of reproof in Jeremiah, and it's uh, what the teacher does in that section is done. You know, a lot of reproof again, back to the word, back to the word, back to the word. But I've noticed there's also, I never really appreciated the great stories that are in Jeremiah. Because uh, every chapter is like a prophecy about somebody. But there's a great story, and I just want to tell that story with you this morning. First of all, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. This introduction, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. So that's who he is and where he came from. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, 
the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. <coughs> Josiah was a king of, of Judah, the southern tribes, and also Jeremiah served, in verse 3, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, so Josiah's son, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So he served for three kings. And that's quite a lifespan, you know. Uh, also, it says right here what this book is about. It's these things happened just before the Babylonians carried away everybody out of Jerusalem. One, some of those that got carried away were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A lot of people were killed. A lot of people were taken away as slaves. Uh, some people were left. There were some poor people that were left in the country. And so Jeremiah served the kings as a prophet and also those that were left called the remnant. Chapter 36 of Jeremiah is the, the chapter that's used in our the current classes we use, Walking in God's Power, how we got the Word of God, chapter 36. You remember that. And you remember that the king at that time was Zedekiah. Uh, Jeremiah got the Word of God. He had it written by Baruch on a scroll. He took it eventually to the king, and what did the king do to it? He chopped it up with a pen knife and burned it in the fire. Did that stop the Word of God from getting out? No. Jeremiah was instructed, do it again. And he did it again. So the king that's in service there is Zedekiah. If you go to chapter 38, I hope that that kind of makes sense as far as getting to where we're going. So he served two kings already. This is the last one just before he was carried away into Babylon. The guy's name is Zedekiah. And he cut God's word up with a penknife, had no regard for it. But things weren't going his way. So, in chapter 38, verse 14. Then, Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him in the third entry, that is, in the house of the Lord. The king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing. Hide nothing from me. So now he's going to the prophet for help, which is interesting. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, and this is where the revelation comes in, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, your life will be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live and thine house. So that's the revelation from God. The Babylonians have circled the city of Jerusalem, and they've got siege engines, and they've ramped up the walls, you know, uh, built dirt things. We saw that, where were we, Megiddo? somewhere they built this ramps up to get to the gate and then break in the revelation is go surrender and you'll live and the city will be spared but if thou will not go forth verse 18 to the king of babylon's princes then shall this city be given into the hand of the chaldeans and they shall burn it with fire and thou shalt not escape out of their hand Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Judeans that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, They will, they shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So it shall be well with thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on, have had prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> so sh they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon. Thou shalt cause the city to be burned with fire. So there you have it. You do what God says in obedience, or you don't. This is what you'll get if you do. This is what you'll get if you don't. 
Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. Don't tell anybody that we met. But if the princes hear that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee, and say unto thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king, hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death also what the king said unto thee. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, and he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all the words that the king had commanded, he kept it secret, so that they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken, and he was there when Jerusalem was taken. This king didn't treat Jeremiah very well at all. He had him in a dungeon full of poop. Uh, he starved him, he had him in prison, and now here he comes for advice. And it's very clear what God wants done, right? If you'll just go outside and surrender, everybody's going to live. We'll see how he does. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, in the tenth month, came Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in, sat in the middle gate. Now, I love these guys. When I read these names, if you don't go to the Lord of the Rings, then you haven't seen those movies. But listen to these Babylonian guys. They sat in the middle gate, even Nergal Sherezer, Samgar Nebo, Sarshkim, Rab Saras, Nergal Sherezer, Rab Mag, and all the residue of the prince of the king of battle. So these were the heavy-duty generals of the army. They just look cool, don't they? <laughs> and they're sitting in the middle gate. That's just awesome. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them, and all the men of war, that they fled, went forth out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the plain. So he's running out of Jerusalem. But the Chaldeans' army pursued after them, overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. When they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. So he's captured. Zedekiah is captured with his people. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah, Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. Instead of obeying God, he disobeyed. What was the result? The last thing he saw was the death of his family. And then his eyes were gone. And he's in chains, off to Babylon. I think, I reflect on what Will just said, you know. Once you know the word, how hard is it to stick to it? Everything in the world wants you to get you off of it. But sticking to it should be a discipline that we work on. Sticking to it, no matter what it looks like. You know, look at what happened to this guy. Here's the word of the Lord. I'm not doing it. Okay, then this is what you get. You know, it's so simple. But terrible, just terrible. Uh, then verse 9. Eight, the Chaldeans burned the king's house, the houses of the people, with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebu, Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away, that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. Now, Daniel and the three lawbreakers were carried away years before this in the first troubles they had with Babylon. So those guys are in training or graduated in Babylon already. So this is the rest, the last of them that are left there. Uh, the remnant of the people that remained in the city and those that fell away, that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. But Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people which had nothing in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Now Nebuchadrezzar, King of Babylon gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebar Adan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, and look well to him, and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. So the king had some regard for Jeremiah, didn't he? Isn't that very interesting? His reputation. Uh, so 
Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, sent, and and here they are, the guys again. Nebu Shashban, Rabsaris, Nergal Sherazar, Rabmag, and all the king of Babylon's princes. Even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison, committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Iakim, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home. So he dwelt among the peoples. Jeremiah is out of jail, and he's living with this guy, Gildan, or whatever his name is, who was appointed to be the governor of the area by the king of Babylon. So he was taken care of. Uh, there was a guy named Ishmael that rose up and killed that guy, Gildan. Broke the laws, and eventually he was taken apart. Uh, so chapter 42. Chapter 42, let's start in verse 1. Yeah, I think the story is like this. The, of the remnant that remained, they were put under the control of this guy Gildan, and then he was killed by this guy named Ishmael. But there were still people in the country. And verse 1 of 42, Then all the captains of the forces, and Jahanan, the son of Kariah, Jezaniah, the son of Hoshaiah and all the people from the least unto the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet let we beseech thee our supplication be accepted before thee and pray for us unto the Lord thy God even for all this remnant for we are left but a few of many as thine eyes do behold us that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you, behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good, whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Those are such wonderful words, aren't they? So sincere. Absolutely. Man, if you say this, thus saith the Lord, that's what we're going to do. This is the remnant. Verse 7, came to pass after 10 days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. And I love that too, because these guys are asking for the word of the Lord. There wasn't a Bible they could read, so they needed revelation. He said, I'll give it to you. And then he waited for 10 days to get it. So in all that time, he was waiting, probably not nervously, and they were waiting, probably nervously. And when that revelation came 10 days later, let this be a lesson to us all. We want everything right now. You know, we go to McDonald's, if it takes longer than a minute we're pissed off we gotta have it right now our phone doesn't work right now our computer doesn't work right now if something doesn't work right now we are an anxious people but you have to realize when God wants to get something to you he promises to get it to you he'll get it to you be patient it's coming uh, there are some things that I've prayed for that have taken years to come to pass but you keep your eyes fixed on him and go it'll get there he promises and here, this 10 days, I think, is very indicative of something to walk, work on in your walk. Then, verse 8, called he Jahanan, the son of Karai, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom you sent me to present your supplication before, if, now this is the word of the Lord, ye will still abide in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up, for I, I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. So there's the word of the Lord. Stay put. I'll bless you. This is the land I gave you by covenant and promise. You'll grow here. You'll be peaceful here. You'll be happy here. Stay put. But if you say we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, we will 
go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, and have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. If you go there, you're going to die. That's what the word of the Lord said. Guess what they did? Chapter 43. So the word of the Lord was, stay put, I will bless you. This is the land I gave you. If you go to Egypt, you know, just down the coast, you'll die. 43.1 came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all those words, then spake those folks, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Baruch the son of Neriah setteth thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. So Johanan the son of Kara and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. So they went to Egypt, and they took Jeremiah with them. When they get down there to Egypt, to Taphanes, verse 8, Jeremiah is still getting revelation, <laughs> and he says... In verse 9, take great stones in thine hand and hide them in the clay in the brick kiln, which is at the entry of Pharaoh's house in Taphanes, in the sight of the men of Judah. So put some rocks in the bricks when they're baking. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will set his throne upon these stones that I have hid, and he shall spread his royal pavilion over him. And when he comes, he shall smite the land of Egypt and deliver such as are for death to death and such as for captivity to captivity, such are for the sword and the sword, to the sword. I wonder what the difference between the death and the sword is. And I will kindle a fire in the house of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them, carrying them away captive, and he shall array himself with the land of Egypt. As a shepherd puts forth on his garment, he shall go forth from thence in peace break the images or whatever. So that prophecy was the king of Babylon is going to take over Egypt too. He's going to put a throne right here where Pharaoh has his. Now all this is great story telling. <laughs> but it shows there's a verse that we read in the class that remember God chose Jerusalem to put his name there as a place that he allowed the temple to be built. And after all this constant disobedience he said I hate this place. I'm going to burn it to the ground. And he did. Because the people uh, refused to do what God had said. So just like Will, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Two clothes, uh, which that's the Holy Spirit working there. It's very nice. Nice to know. Uh, but from the working translation, just because, you know, in our administration, there's a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of mercy. But even those guys back then, what was God's will? They had disobeyed. They lost everything. And God said, just stay here. I'll take care of you. I'll let you grow and you'll be prosperous. And they just said no. You know, it just doesn't make sense, does it? Uh, people are so proud sometimes. They just won't allow God to direct them. And it's just hard. But I guess he knew that. He, he made them. So, but in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12, from the working translation. Therefore, my beloved ones, even as you have always obeyed God, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling. Salvation uh, that is being talked about here is from their, the people of Philippi were in conflicts, and you can see that in the verses, in the chapters reading, leading up to this. But the fear and trembling, according to Bishop Palai, the phrase fear and trembling was an idiom meaning reverence and obedience. Reverence and obedience on the part of obedient servants who did what they were told to do. And that, that is a much better translation of that verse. And I think about that in light of the story from Jeremiah. Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they just listen to God's word? They asked for God's word. They got God's word. Why didn't they just do it? You know? Obedience is a very big key. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do and to work for his good pleasure. And 
an interesting aside there. For good pleasure, Philippians 1, verse 6, you can look this up later, and Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 9, the good pleasure of God is there. Philippians 1, 6, and Ephesians 1, 5 and 9. Do all things without, without grumbling and disputing. Grumbling is the sound of air in a shell. Uh, a low voice manifesting discontent. They go to Jeremiah and say, what should we do? This is what you do. Then there's this grumbling. Then there's this murmuring. I don't know. If, you know, gee, Egypt's a lot warmer. We should go down there. What about, you know, they have great sites down there. Pyramids are neat. Grumbling. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. And, you know, it's the word. So do it. Simple enough? That's the way to do it. That's the simple life. That's the more abundant life. It's the word. Do it. Okay. There you go. So that you may be blameless and pure or unmixed. And that's a metallurgical term. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine as stars or luminaries in the world. And Will made such a great point. Uh, the only law that we need to adhere to is what the Word says. You know, the law of God, the law of the Word, the law of love. And we walk as children in this dark world like stars, <coughs> bright lights, by doing the Word. If those guys would have just stayed in Judah, they'd have been fine. And eventually, the whole world would have said, man, Babylon conquered everybody, but look at those guys. They're doing great. But no, they didn't. So they did not shine. And verse 16 says, by, this is how it's done, holding on to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ my boasting will be that I did not run the race in vain nor labor hard in vain. Uh, crooked and perverted, to turn or twist through, through twisting or turning away. Perversion is, here's the truth, let's twist it and make it a little different. And that's what that means. So thanks, Will, for teaching that. I just kind of went over it briefly, but... I guess what God is telling us all here today from what both of us shared without talking to each other beforehand, uh, yeah, there's a world out there. Our job is to do what the Word says. When we do, there will be great prosperity, peace, provision. That's what the Word is saying to you today. So we're not saying don't wear a mask. We're not saying don't sneeze on people. Or, well, you shouldn't sneeze on people. There's crazy stuff going on out there, but guess who's going to be taken care of if they obey the word? You and me. That's the simple truth of it, and that's what we've got to keep our eyes fixed on. God says he'll take care of us. God says he'll provide us with health and prosperity. Who are you going to believe? There's your choice. Are you going to go to Egypt, or are you going to stick around? There's your choice. And I think that's the message he's got for us today. So thank you, Father, for your word, and thank you for the living word. Thank you for your blessing on your people here that are here and also your people scattered throughout the region where we live. We pray for health and strength. We pray for your provision. We will do our best to stand on what you've said and to stay faithful to that no matter what it looks like outside. Please bless us all, Father, and take care of us in the coming weeks ahead. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.